Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Lviv of Camera on Campus, and thank you all for registering for this event. We're really excited for our conversation with Hen Mazig with some housekeeping items before we do. And we are currently in webinar format, um, so you'll be able to participate and engage in the conversation by submitting questions in the Q&A function below. But before we do that as well, I'm gonna introduce our moderator for this event, our camera fellow, Julia Pratt, and I wanna thank our co-sponsors, um, Canes for Israel and TUFI, the Israel clubs at the University of Miami and Tulane University. Um, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Julia Pratt, our camera fellow who's done an amazing job uh, leading up to this event. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for being here today. I am so excited to get started. I'm gonna introduce our speaker, Hen Mazig. So, Hen Mazig is an Israeli writer, a columnist for the Jewish Journal, and a speaker who has inspired thousands around the world with his story. He was named as one of the Algaminer's top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life in 2018, top 50 online pro-Israel influencers, and top 50 LGBTQ plus influencers. He is an energetic activist and an advocate for his people. As the son of Mizrahi Jewish refugees from Iraq and North Africa, Hen has a unique and important voice in today's discussions, sharing his family's story as part of the 850,000 Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa. As a young Israeli, Hen served in the IDF for almost five years as an openly gay commander. During his service as a lieutenant in the Kogat unit, he worked as an intermediary between the Israeli Defense Forces, the Palestinian Authority, the UN, and many NGOs that operate in the West Bank. Hen's unit was responsible for overseeing the construction of medical facilities, schools, environmental projects, roads, water-related infrastructure, and security coordination with the Palestinian Security Forces, part of the Palestinian Authority. From 2013 to 2050, Hen was the campus coordinator for a pro-Israel campus group in the Pacific Northwest, during which he fought many BDS resolutions on college campuses. From 2015 to 2017, Hed led the Israel Education Department for a pro-Israel advocacy organization. He quickly became the leading Israel voice for reclaiming intersectionality and progressive Zionism. Hen's award-winning articles have been published in the LA Times, Newsweek, NBC News, Haaretz, The Forward, Jewish Chronicle, International Business Times, and many, many more. He has shared his story with thousands of students throughout the USA, Canada, and the UK over the last eight years. In September of 2016, he began working as a freelance consultant to help pro-Israel and social justice causes. And he's also volunteered at the head of the transgender and health department at the National Israeli LGBTQ Task Force, the Near Kate Center in Tel Aviv. Hen is very active on social media with tens of thousands of followers on his social media networks. In July of 2020, he spearheaded a campaign drawing in international celebrities combating anti-Semitism on Twitter. Hen has a proven track record for creating dialogue and changing hearts and minds where it seems impossible. He has built relationships and changed hearts and minds not simply by sharing the truth about Israel and the history of the region, but by being a voice for truth about Israel and the justice for diverse groups and peoples. He is a rare voice in a, div in a divisive day and age that can unite people for a common cause rather than sowing discord over clashing narratives. Welcome, Ken. I'm so excited to have you here today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and thank you, uh, Cameron Campus, uh, the different organizations that have sponsored it, Tulane University students, um, and everyone that has joined us. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are uh, probably tired from all the Zoom events that you've been part of. So I want this to be um, uh, a bit more exciting. If you have any questions or comments and um, things that you want to say, you can do it in the, in the chat. Um, and yeah, and I'll, I'll get started. I'll make sure to keep enough time at the end of my presentation for, um, for Q&A. Um, but um, yeah, I'll start with, my, with myself. My, my name is Chen Mazig. I'm an Israeli writer and a speaker um, from Israel. I uh, was born and raised in Israel, lived all my life. Uh, today, I live in London, um, in this Airbnb place that I'm staying at because uh, me and my partner are supposed to move to um, to our flat um, in uh, next week. So I mean, the end of this week. So um, so we're kind of like in between. Um, and yeah, that's that's where we're quarantining. Um, I hope you all are safe and well as well. Um, it's just uh, it's a crazy time. I couldn't even get a haircut for uh, <laughs> for months now. Um, but you know that's well. 
it's not not complaining at all because there is you know at least a, just happy to be safe and and happy that you all are uh, also safe and well. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I was born in Israel. I um, was born in Petah Tikva. Uh, it's a suburb of Tel Aviv, although most of Israel is a suburb of Tel Aviv. Um, and my family came to Israel in the early 50s. My family from my father's side uh, came to Israel from Tunisia, from uh, North Africa. Um, my last name suggests the, the affiliation of my family to uh, the Amazigh tribe. Amazigh uh, are the most indigenous tribe to North Africa. It was the first inhabitants of, uh, uh, of North Africa. Um, and the connection between the, I mean, there's Amazigh Jews, but there's also Amazigh uh, people that are not Jews. Um, but there was a real strong connection between the Jewish community and the Amazigh community, and specifically this, uh, the Amazigh Jews were the ones that created this link. Um, this folklore about um, uh, uh, a Jewish Amazigh queen, um, Queen Daya, that led the, um, the fight against the Islamic expansion towards North Africa. Hey, Ali. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry, just saying hi. Um, and uh, uh, she was, uh, she was uh, a Jewish queen that basically her name was also Kahina, and Kahina means uh, uh, Cohen in, uh, uh, in Arabic. So it was, um, she was called by the Islamic scholars, the, um, the, the Jewish sorcerer, basically. And in the 500 BC, she was the one leading those, uh, the Amazigh armies and um, fought the Islamic expansion toward North, North Africa until she lost. But um, the, the widespread belief is that uh, her descendants are the Jewish Amazigh because she was Jewish. Um, and I, mean, I think, you know, her story is so unique because uh, when you read more about how she fought those armies and how she didn't want it to assimilate because when Muhammad's armies, when the uh, Islamic armies, armies reached North Africa, they, um, they gave the the people that they encountered, their religious minorities, they gave them the option of either converting to Islam or to um, and and you know accept the Islamic rule, or that they can just fight them. And uh, until her last day, uh, she was, according to the stories, she was fighting um, just to maintain her identity. And I think it's uh, such a beautiful story of uh, of resistance in the face of assimilation. Um, and uh, even though she lost at the end, I mean, her descendants uh, still exist. Um, but yeah, so my family uh, lived in Tunisia. In Tunisia, until the 1950s, you had um, 105,000 Jewish people living there. Sorry, um, out of those, uh, I mean, out of those 105,000 today, there's less than a few hundreds that uh, remain. Um, they all had to live in, um, between the years of 1940 to 50, 51, 52, 1952, um, as long, you know, as well with most Jews that lived in North Africa. Um, and my family um, had to leave. Often we, you know, people don't know that, but uh, the Holocaust didn't, you know, we know that the Holocaust happened in Europe, but it also reached North Africa. My grandparents, my grandmother told me the stories of how they worked in, um, um, forced ca labor camps in, in Tunisia and uh, how they, um, my, grand my grandfather was supposed to be sent to, to death camps and just days before the, um, the Holocaust ended, they, uh, they were saved. Um, but yeah, but in, in, in the 50s when, I mean, when they knew that they had to leave, they, they left everything behind and they became refugees and, and got and moved to, to Israel. Um, you know, they, there wasn't anywhere else for them. Uh, back then, um, America didn't open the gates to Jews from uh, North Africa and neither did any other country. It was, Israel was their only hope. Um, and Israel was there for them uh, to, to offer them refuge. Uh, while my family from my father's side um, were coming to Israel from North Africa, my family from my mother's side came to Israel from Iraq. Uh, in Iraq, there was a population of uh, 150,000 Jews. Um, actually, two thirds of Baghdad uh, was uh, was Jewish, um, the capital of Iraq. And um, when I'm asking my grandmother about the time in Iraq, she says, "You know, we lived there forever. We knew we lived there when it was Babylon, and then when it was Iraq, um, it was our home, and uh, it was." 
they always felt safe. That's what she, t- she tells me. But when I ask further, I'm trying to understand exactly what she means by it was safe. I realized that for her being safe means um, to pay that the fact that they were paying fees and if they paid their tax, the Jiza for being, um, for being non-Muslim, uh, they received this um, um, protection of being a dimi. And the dimi in Arabic means uh, a protected minority. Um, and yeah, my family were, um, they knew that they had to be, um, that, you know, that, that, that they were safe, but it's, their safety is dependent on whether or not the ruler wants them uh, to be safe. And uh, everything really changed for the Jewish community of Iraq in 1941. Um, so there's this uh, um, conversation about um, the Jews of Iraq, if they lived safely or not, or if there was, you know, if it, because of Israel that the violent, because of Israel's reestablishment that uh, in 1948, um, that everything changed for them. But um, the truth of the matter is that it started way before that. And in 1941, it was um, um, two days of pogrom against the Jewish community of Iraq that really changed everything for them. Um, it was days of uh, rage, of uh, violence attacks that were incited by Nazi agents, uh, but were conducted by Iraqi officers um, and, and Iraqi officials. Um, hundreds of Jews were killed, thousands were, um, were injured. Um, and the, um, the, this, these two days were called, uh, received the name Farhud. Farhud in Arabic means uh, violent disposition. Um, and the, those were the, you know, these were the days that changed everything for Iraqi Jews. They knew that they can't stay in Iraq anymore, that it's not safe for them. Um, in safety, again, as I said before, it was, it's also a, uh, um, um, subjective. And uh, um, I think that Iraqi Jews uh, knew that their safety was always uh, dependent on if the ruler wanted to wanted them to stay safe or not. Um, it took my family, I mean, those two days, those two days, my grandmother, uh, my Iraqi grandmother told, told me that she saw horrific stuff, you know, uh, violence and rape. And uh, she saw a mother, a Jewish mother and her eight children being killed. Uh, in the streets, uh, horrific views that um, left her, um, you know, with a lot of trauma. Um, and after they saved money and um, were ready to leave Iraq in 1951, it was the time that the Iraqi government um, passed the uh, the citizenship um, citizenship law, which is basically the law that that, um, that allows Iraqi Jews, the only, only Jews in Iraq, to give up their citizenship if they want to come to Israel. Um, that's what my family did, and they, um, they gave up their citizenship. Um, on their passport, they stamped uh, this passport with uh, never to return. Um, and my family just left, and um, on, on the way to the airport, when you know, they had suitcases and they wanted to bring a lot of things with them, but they were allowed only one suitcase uh, for family. Um, and and they had to leave all of their property and all of their belongings behind. And, you know, in this, in this flight uh, to Israel from Iraq, um, they, they were refugees, basically. They had, um, they didn't have any country, they didn't have any nationality. Um, and when they arrived to Israel, they arrived back home. I think it's uh, it's challenging for a lot of people to understand how can you be a refugee when you're calling Israel your home and you're coming back to your home. And I think that's really the, um, the nuance that is important to understand here. Iraq was their home. Um, they spoke the language, they, it's their culture, they cooked Middle Eastern food, they're still cooking Middle Eastern food. That's why the Israeli cuisine is so Middle Eastern. Um, but they, so while they left their, their home behind and they were refugees, they have returned to their indigenous homeland, they returned to Israel. Um, and uh, yeah, so my, my family returned to Israel and, and they stayed where, you know, they, as I said, I was born in Petah Tikva to um, my parents. And, um, and when, I, uh, when, I was, when I was 18, I had to join the army. The military is mandatory in Israel. Um, and men serve for three years, women serve for two years, you probably know that. Um, 
And most of my friends, um, when when you join the Israeli army, you get to choose uh, a unit or, or you know the top three units that you want to uh, that you want to join to. And um, I chose to join the Kogat unit, the coordinator of government activities in the territories, uh, a very unique unit of uh, thousands of soldiers that their whole job is to um, is to take care of the Palestinian civilians. Um, it was unique among my, among my friends. I was starting to say that my friends, um, most of them joined um, combat units and tried to do, um, you know, they wanted to do security work. Um, and I was, um, I think a lot of the experience that I had from growing up really affected me in um, making me want to do something that will promote peace. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's another thing that I, that I find that is hard for people to understand. Uh, when when I'm talking about the Israeli army and I'm talking about going to do combat work or security work, sorry, the Israeli army is very unique in the sense that it's not, you know, when we're sending soldiers abroad, uh, abroad, or when we sell, when we sell, when we send the soldiers to to the front lines, the front lines are not abroad. Uh, they're not thousands of miles away from their homes. They don't need to go on jets or on planes to travel, uh, they're not fighting for oil, they're not fighting for gas or uh, democracy or anything like that. Uh, they're fighting for uh, the safety of the country and the safety of uh, the Jewish people, um, uh, well, all people in Israel, but uh, both Jews and non-Jews. Um, but it's, uh, it's just a two hours ride from their home and they get to the front line. And that's, um, that's something that is important to remember because um, the feeling of, uh, um, of you know, of, of, of the devotion and that knowing that um, if you're going to if if you're going to do something wrong or if you're not going to do your work well, that might have consequences of on your family. It's something that every Israeli soldier knows, and I think that's why uh, when we're talking about the Israeli army, it's important to do this distinction. While it's uh, like other armies, but it's not really like other armies because the army itself is not an army that is meant to fight or take conquer land or or um, travel abroad it's an army that just uh take care i mean just protecting borders um so i, I joined the Kogat unit and um, i was stationed as a international organization's uh, liaison officer um i worked for five years working with the united nations with the international organizations that um worked in the west bank um uh, and the gaza strip um we worked mostly on uh, uh, infrastructure projects, on uh, uh, you know building hospitals, building roads, uh, taking care of uh, humanitarian uh, needs of the of the civilians in the areas that I've served. I served in Hebron, Ramallah, and Jerusalem periphery. Um, and I think my my service was very um, um, inspiring for me because I was able to work with civilians uh, on the other side and really help them. Um, with you know help bringing peace closer um and that was something that um it's really privileged to to have the opportunity to do that through uh, my my military service um and uh, that's why i ended up doing it for five years um during my military service i also came out of the closet uh it was a uh, slow coming out i mean i came out to um my commander a few soldiers but being in the IDF, I felt like, you know, and later on to my family as well, um, but being in the IDF, I, was, I felt like I was able to, uh, to find my own identity and to be open about, my, um, about who I am. Um, and uh, it's something that, you know, if I look at the Middle East and, and I've seen other LGBTQ um, folks throughout the Middle East, it's something that we're still not able to do. Um, of course, Israel has is much more advanced in many um, in many of the um, of the issues that the LGBTQ people care about. We still don't have same sex marriage, which is uh, very um, disheartening and something that a lot of us are working to solve. But um, but we are safe and we are protected, um, and that's something that I know that many um, many in Israel are working every day <clears throat> to um, to solve. Um, and yeah, and after this five years of uh, service, I, uh, I've moved to Seattle. I lived in Seattle for a few years. And um, from Seattle, I traveled uh, throughout the US to do the speaking events that now I'm doing on Zoom, uh, speaking on uh, BDS resolutions, um, on debates, and trying to combat uh, anti Semitism um, in North America, also in Europe, 
um, and it's uh, it's it's challenging. It's um, it's always uh, it's, you know it's something that um, I'm doing it because I'm very passionate and, and it's very close to me. My my family, the the trauma that my family had and brought with them from uh, um, from Iraq and Tunisia uh, is very connected to anti-Semitism. Um, but it's also connected to the fact that they were um, they were not perceived as part of the uh, imperial identity or imperial homogeny that they were living in. Uh, my family in Iraq weren't considered Arabs, uh, and my family in North Africa and Tunisia weren't considered part of the, um, and they weren't Muslim, so they weren't uh, part of the controlling homogeny. And, and I think that a lot of this came, I mean, I, I speak with my grandparents and my, and my parents and my, <clears throat> sorry, and my uh, uh, uncles and aunts, and I see that this was really something that affected them, and it's something that um, was is is so important for me to do because I think that um, today what we're seeing, and with the rise of anti-Semitism, with the rise of uh, um, anti-Zionism, that is uh, often you know slipping into anti-Semitism, and uh, I don't, you know, I think that while there's um, there is, I mean, maybe some people can make a case for anti-Zionism that is not against the Jews. Uh, if they say that they are against every country and they think there shouldn't be any borders. Um, but then again, why do you only focus on Israel, right? Um, but my point is that, um, I mean, today when we're seeing this, uh, this form, this, this type of uh, hatred to the Jewish community is something that is not foreign to, to me, it's something that my family experienced and I feel like I have the obligation on, of, of, of fighting it. Um, I could keep on going and share, when you do, share with you some stories, but I'd love to see if you have some questions as, I'm moving forward. Um, does anyone has any question so far? I can start reading some of the questions. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. All right. Thank you so much. Wow, okay, let's jump right into it. So okay. our first question is, what is the worst thing someone has said to you on social media and how did you respond? Oh, wow. Uh, what's the worst thing that someone told me on social media? I get a lot of nasty stuff every day. Um, um, I mean, I'm try I'll, I'll try and think of some terrible things. Some people say that I am, uh, that I hate Palestinians um, when I served for five years defending Palestinian civilians um, and, and helping uplift them, you know, and, and supporting them. Um, some people say that some 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 person said that I'm actually homophobic because uh, I'm a gay person that supports Israel and that's homophobic because it's against. I mean, it's ridiculous, but that's something that I heard as well. Recently, someone said that I'm actually against. Uh, I'm anti-Semitic that I'm against Jews because well, there was two people. One one of them said that I'm anti-Semitic because I'm supporting Israel and Israel is anti-Semitic, and another person said, because they said that the existence of Israel actually causes violence against Jews. I know it's ridiculous. I'm just telling you the things that I'm hearing. And then another person said that I'm against, uh, that I'm anti-Semitic because, uh, because I speak about Mizrahi Jews and that uh, harms the Jewish community, which is also ridiculous. But I mean, all those ideas are being spread around and that's, and that's something that I'm seeing on social media. I think it's important for everyone because we're all using social media is to remember that um, Anyone can start a social media account, and there's some people out there that has uh, that have. Um, there's people out. I mean, you know, the world is like there's there's people out there that don't really have um, um, rational um, way of thinking, and they have uh, um, really sinister uh, agenda, and they want to harm other people. Um, and we can't know who's behind, you know, this avatar avatar or the username that we don't know. Uh, on Twitter and you know where um, all we can do is just like remind ourselves our values and say okay am I upholding my values if it is, is what I'm saying and what I'm posting really um, um, is on brand on your values you know so um, so for me it's a it's a, it's it's a big challenge to always uh, to find the right words and to make sure that when people because you know like the, the big challenge is that you want to listen to people. You want to find, you want to hear what people have to say. And, um, and I always say that I'm never, I'm not, I'm not about, above learning and improving and, 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 and I make mistakes. Absolutely. Oh my God. I said some crazy stuff on online that I shouldn't have said not crazy, but like not nice stuff online. Um, things that I wish I didn't say. Um, and, uh, 
um yeah i think it's just like it's very important to to listen and to read but also to filterize and to and to keep your values and and remember that some you know at the end of the day some people are not gonna like what you have to say um and i said it the other day that someone was asking me you know some people were challenging me online and i said yeah i mean you can't be everything for everyone and still be true to who you are um um you you know some people are not gonna like you but um if they don't pay your bills you te- you pay them no mind that's what we say thank you building off of that question how do you know when it's worth it or not to respond to certain social media criticisms of Israel and or certain instances of anti-Semitism on social media? I'm sorry, you, you just broke up. You broke, uh, can you repeat yeah. the question? Sorry. Yes, I can repeat the question. So I was saying, building off of that, another question that came in was, how do you know when it's worth it to respond to an instance of criticizing Israel or something anti-Semitic? Like, how do you know when it is right to respond or to respond at all? Right. Well, that's that's another really good question. And it's a, a very big question because um, often we have this debate, like, are we going to um, um, to give more attention to this anti-Semitic statement um, by responding to it or by amplifying it? Um, there was a thing with the with the Saturday Night Live. Uh, they did, they had, there was a joke there the other in the last episode about how a, a joke. Um, they, they said how uh, Israel was vaccinating half of its population, and then the um, the butt of the joke the joke was uh, how it's you know the the comedian said that it's uh, um, he, in, it's probably the Jewish part, like it's probably the Jewish half of the country, um, which was I mean very I mean I think it was anti-Semitic and, and terrible to suggest that Jews would, and it's not true also it's factually incorrect like in Israel. Um, um, Countless, I mean, I don't know the numbers, but I think about 20% or something like that uh, of the Arab population was also vaccinated. Um, there wasn't any discrimination on who was getting the vaccination. Um, and I thought to myself, wait, are we going to give this more attention by calling this out? And I mean, um, indeed, the, when when all this conversation started happening online, it gave more attention to this uh, to this uh, to this joke. But um, but I thought it was also given some more. T- it, you know, given attention to the accuracy of, I mean, the factual um, um, numbers that actually Arab Israelis were vaccinated. Um, so that's just recent example, but I often ask myself that, and I think it's um, it's about trying to think um, three steps ahead as much as we can um, and, and think, okay, if I'm going to respond to this thing, what is gonna happen? What is the consequences that we want to do? Um, the biggest challenge for me is that everything, I mean, <laughs> doing this work is that everything is personal. Like there's not everything people say to me. I, I have my face online. I have my, um, my you know, pictures with my, with my boyfriend, pictures with my family. Like I'm very open about who I am. Um, and and what I'm, everything I'm doing is for my people. So when people attack me, they, they're not only attacking me. I feel like I'm, it's an attack on all of us. And I, um, and I often have this challenge. So I'm trying to just, uh, um, to just try and think ahead and see and say, okay, what will happen if I um, if I respond to this uh, to this issue, and how should I respond to to it in a positive way? And if I'm not going to amplify someone that otherwise wouldn't get attention, and um, and if I am amplifying someone that might get attention from what I'm what I'm going to say, um, if it's the right person to amplify. So, an example, um, uh, there's. Um, there's many anti-Zionist voices out there. Anti- there's a few anti. It seems like every anti-Zionist Jew in the world has a Twitter account. Um, but uh, I would often not engage with those people because I don't think that they like they're making arguments that sound rational, but it's not rational if you really hear what they're saying. Um, but then you have you know you have people like Ariel Gold. Uh, Ariel Gold, she's the head of Code Pink, an anti-Israel organization, and she often says things that are so cringy and so off that uh, for me it's okay to amplify her because I think that if I want to if I want to show you know the the other the other side I would show them in uh, with Ariel Go because she's a great example of someone that is not rational and makes really crazy remarks like she said that Jews are indigenous to Spain or something like that like really ridiculous stuff so um so it's good so it's really um it's 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 about like thinking ahead and thinking which people we want to to respond to um and and what is the consequences of whatever we're going to do is something going to change do we want to raise awareness are we speaking in an echo chamber that is not going to change anything um so it's all about that
for me. Thank you. All right, our next question is, do you think it is more effective to debate on a common thread or via private message? What has been more effective for you? Um, I find that um, direct messages are much better. Um, I do have some people, you know, people challenge me on um, to my uh, on my posts, uh, and that's okay. I try and answer um, to those messages. I also, you know, there's um, probably some of you heard about it. That this uh, um, theory of like whenever you speak to an audience, there's five percent that is against whatever you stand for, and there's five percent that is for whatever you stand for, and there's ninety percent in the middle. Um, that those are the people that you want to convince, right? Um, and I think that often when I get to this type of uh, um, conversations online uh, and I'm thinking, is it better to just do it on direct messages or, or continue this conversation? Um, um, I'm thinking about the people that are the 90% the 90 in the middle. I'm thinking about what they're going to see. Uh, so even if I'm arguing with someone that is anti-Semitic, I'm going to make sure that I don't come across as the one that is unreasonable, that is, uh, um, that is going after someone like to be just a reasonable person because I know that a lot of people are going to look at it like there's you know you, you might not change this person's mind but you want to change the mind of everyone else that are uh, that are watching the the ninety percent so uh, I often think of like how we can change their minds um, when I see yeah I mean however I, however when there's when there's someone that I think so that sorry the first example was for people that I think are are lost and are not going to change their mind. Uh, but if if there's someone that I think might change their mind, um, I will DM them and I will have a conversation with them. And I can give you give one example, a short story from um, a couple of months ago when before this lockdown in the UK, um, there was a, a blogger, a, uh, um, um, a lady that she's a, a beauty blogger and uh, she's speaking about being a plus size model. Um, and she's also a, a black woman in the UK. Um, and she was chosen to be um, an editor for some magazine and a tweet from her, from her past came surfaced again from like 10 years ago of her saying, uh, making a joke about the Holocaust, which is really bad and, uh, and really anti-Semitic joke. Um, but the tweet surfaced and um, um, I saw that a lot of the Jewish community were attacking her and saying, this is terrible, like she needed to be fired. And actually they did got her to be fired at the end because of the public outrage um and i started thinking you know if it's what is it going to do to this girl she's young she said something 10 years ago but um i'm sure she evolved i mean i said things 10 years ago that i've you know changed my mind about um and all this like cancel culture is just such a poor thing like we can't cancel people we can't bring tweets from their past and say this is who they are. No, people say things. I mean, we all say things that we regret, right? And I, I was convinced that this girl, girl also said something that she regret. And I reached out to her and um, she actually answered me. And she has, you know, I, I saw this person with hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram and on Twitter. And I didn't want her to come out of this experience thinking that the whole Jewish community was against her. Um, I wanted to offer a way to evolve and to learn. And um, I invited her for coffee. Um, we, we met in central London, we, we had coffee together and, and she was really in tears all, all the conversation. She said she feels so embarrassed and so terrible about what she did and she wanted to make it better. Um, and then we met a few more times after that. Um, but I was so impressed to see this, um, this girl really wanting and, and wanting to, to be better. And, and I think it was, um, it was something that I took with me since then. I mean, every time I see, and I saw a few others, um, in this, you know, during this time that I reach out to and I try to help them improve, you know, we are a minority Jewish community and we can't attack everyone that that say stuff that we that are anti-Semitic. We, I mean, it's important to call it out. Absolutely, call it out whenever you see it. But if you see that it's a person that might change his mind and might, you know, and and might apologize and and maybe they made a mistake, that we can help them see the light. Like, let's try and reach out to them. Let's try and help them. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, I, I reached out to Mark Lamont Hill, the, the guy that was fired from CNN for anti-Semitic um, comments, and, and we had a Zoom call, um, and, the, and he didn't listen to anything I wanted to say. It was so stubborn and so 
fixated on what he believed that was true. Um, we ended the call without any resolution. So sometimes it's also might not be the, the right thing, but, but give it a try if you think that there's a potential. That's, that's my advice. Thank you. All right, we're gonna switch gears a little in this next question. It is, did you experience homophobia in the IDF? I know that Israel is generally accepting, but maybe not some religious Jews. Uh, yeah, I absolutely did. Uh, not only in the IDF, I mean, uh, facing homophobia is um, something I think most gay, gay people around the world would, would know that you know, it exists and it's something that we see around us. Um, in the IDF, I experienced when only came out after, after I was a commander, uh, was an officer, and one of the soldiers in the same base that I was serving at um, made a homophobic remark. I, I can't even remember what it was, but something very stupid and, and poor. And, um, um, and I reported to my commander about that. And my commander said um, that this is inexcusable. Um, and he called the soldier and he put him in martial trial. Uh, and he was sent to, um, to uh, military prison for uh, a week for, uh, for a, a homophobic remark, which was, you know, it was serious, but I think my commander wanted to make sure that soldiers knew in the space that it's not, you know, that you're not gonna target other people based on their identity. It, uh, I know that this commander, specific commander really cared about LGBTQ rights as well, but I knew that he also cared about, um, um, about the, the black soldiers in the base. He didn't want them to experience racism. He didn't want it, anyone to experience, and wanted women in the base to, fit, to, to, to experience um, um, misogyny or or, um, or feeling un, un, you know uncomfortable in the base as well, and I think that he did this to make sure that everyone knows that you know there's a limit. And um, but I know that in, from other friends that I had that this is something that's very common in the IDF, not homophobia, but taking care of this uh, um, of this of this you know situations. And um, it's not. It doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, I, I know that the IDF is taking uh, serious measures to to protect um, uh, LGBTQ soldiers. So much so that uh, a good friend of mine in in the IDF, um, well, we're not in touch now, but we used to be friends. Um, he, uh, he he served as an, uh, a trans um, soldier and then later on a commander in the IDF when you know. We know that in the last four years, it was very difficult for trans soldiers in the in the American army. Um, but in Israel, it's something that has been going on for years. Um, and yeah, I think it's uh, it's really important that it's not only just like we're saying with anti-Semitism, also with homophobia. Um, those type of hatreds, once it's allowed in society, it affects the whole society, and it says that something is really rotten in those in this place. So um, I, I think like I think that's that's why it's really important for us to fight every type of bigotry and racism that we're seeing, even as Jews, I think for us as Jews even more so, you know, we have to fight anti-Semitism, but we also have to fight racism, we have to fight um, um, homophobia, we have to fight every type of bigotry um, and create, I mean, we, we are all, you know, we want to live in a better world for all of us. Um, as we're fighting anti-Semitism, we have to fight every form of bigotry. Thank you. All right, our next question. How do you stay positive and unafraid to say you are Jewish when you see all the hate going on? Um, it's hard. Um, it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, it's really hard. I mean, there's, there's no way around it. It's, uh, I, I, I know that, you know, having all those different identities that I have, like being, being um, um, being a, a gay person, being a, Miz, um, a Mizrahi person, being Jewish, being Israeli, like having all of those identities, I know that there's something about me, but that people are not going to like. Um, and seeing anti-Semitism uh, and seeing anti-Semitism firsthand. I mean, in 2016, um, I was here in London uh, for an event, actually with camera on campus, uh, where uh, some few hundred students um, broke into my talk and uh, started shouting at us and, sorry, broke open the window, jumped into the classroom. Um, and it was really terrifying. So, I mean, got to a point that 20 police officers had to come and rescue me and the students out of the school. Um, 
And I remember thinking after that, like, this is really, like, this is really traumatic, not only for me, for me and the students that were with me. Um, but then I started thinking about what my family went through. Um, and I thought about not only my grandparents and my great grandparents, but I mean, generations before, um, think about like how much they had to go through just to maintain their Jewish identity. Um, the easiest thing for my grandparents in Iraq would have been to, you know, to convert to Islam and, um, and abandon their Jewish identity. Um, and I'm sure it would be the same for, for other, you know, uh, other Jews in the world to assimilate to a different, um, uh, 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 assimilate to a different um, uh, culture. Um, but yeah, Holly here says this was legit a crazy moment to be watching live and to be there in person. So crazy. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was really scary to, um, to experience it for me and for everyone. But um, but again, like thinking about this moment, that this was probably the worst um, attack that I had on on college campuses or in events. Um, that was for me like um, I after that I said to myself, you know, if all this hatred exists, like we have to. Um, it means that we have to redouble our efforts to fight anti-Semitism, and that um, just being silence is not an option. And um, and that it's greater than me, and, and that's something that I always always think to myself. And when I do this work, it's it's tiring, and it's so tiring online and in you know in real life, like to have people um, that know my name. That um, one time in the street, like someone stopped me and was like starting to curse me uh, with knowing my name and like to just recognize me. I was also a lot on on uh, on the on the British television, on Sky News and BBC. And I guess they knew that I was Israeli and they started saying things about Palestinians and yelling at me and I just walked away. But it's, yeah, it's it's scary, but it's but it's not about me and it's not about any of us alone. I mean, it's about all of us together. It's about um, our, you know, generations before us of, uh, of our grandparents and everything they went through that, you know, when I speak, I always tell myself when I speak that I'm speaking for my, 12 uncles and aunts uh, from my mother's side and my 16 uncles and aunts from my father's side, um, that none of them can speak or, or has, the, has the opportunity to, um, to speak in English and to, uh, to post stuff on social media. And I feel like that, you know, I have the, um, um, uh, I have the responsibility to do it um, because, it's, uh, because they don't have the opportunity to do it. And, and I want all of you to remember it. I know that you have people in your family that might not have the ability to, to do everything that we're doing on social media and online, but we're doing it for, for all Jews. We're doing it for, for our family members and we're all one family. So I think that's, um, that's what we do it for. Wow, I have a question actually building off of that. I'm very curious. So I studied abroad for a year in London at King's College in London, and it was like no other in terms of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And now that you're in London, do you feel safe as a Jew to identify yourself? Like, I remember my parents said to me, like, please don't wear your Jewish star. Or, like, don't, like, we want you to be safe. You're a girl, you're in a new city. Like, we want you to be protected walking around. For you now living in London and walking around, do you feel safe, like, identifying yourself in a city that's notorious for anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. And it's, and I'm, I'm sorry you feel this way. I mean, as you were saying, as you were saying how you felt, I mean, just like, it's so painful to hear that. I mean, we're, and I mean, I know it's honest. I know it's like, I know because I feel that too. And I know many people that are feeling that, um, many Jews that are feeling it. And that's why it's so ridiculous when people don't understand that being Jewish in public, uh, when outside of Israel means that you are a minority, a marginalized minority that is, that, is you know is subjected in many countries to the highest rates of of hate crimes uh and you know that if you will be identified you will be attacked and for i'm sure for some of us we can um um we can dress differently and maybe hide some of the characteristics but um but it doesn't change the fact that we are jewish and as long as you are jewish you are subject to hate crimes and that's um and you're yeah i mean i, I hear what you're saying completely and that's something that i always have in my uh, in my mind in, in London. Um, right now with the closure, like I didn't really feel it, but uh, it is scary. Um, and often I get, I mean, 
I'm going to parties with my or to parties of my boyfriend's friends and someone would find out that I'm from Israel and immediately like there will be a conversation and uh, my friend is very progressive but uh, so all of his friends are very progressive as well and it's and it's and they all have opinions about what Israel is doing so that's like for me always stresses me out and bless him my boyfriend always like whenever he sees that this conversation starts he immediately gets in and and like and shuts it down um but it, yeah but yeah it's very uncomfortable so for me it's like going down the streets like is I, I know that some people might recognize me and every like every every few days that we walk down down the street some someone would would identify me positively like some Jewish person that will say thank you I saw you on TV I saw you online I love what you're doing um or it will be um rarely it's like people that are um, more hateful um it's a bit scary yeah but it's um um you know that's that's what we just uh we, we can't let fear lead us we have to um stay strong thank you all right what advice can you give to students when they see something anti-semitic or anti-zionist online what actions can they take um that's a really good question um and the most frustrating thing is to report a comment or a post that is anti-semitic and get an answer from twitter and facebook and instagram that tells us that it's not violating their um uh, their terms um and i know it is because i you know i report so many comments all the time um you have to keep doing it uh because the more of us report comments the more they the more seriously they take it um so my advice is when you see something that doesn't go against the, that that does go against the privacy of the the policies of uh um of the social media network reported and hopefully like more of us will report it and and then they will actually take it off um if you see that it's something that you can address i mean not only like reporting is step a like the first step the second step would be um to see if it's something that you can engage with and if you can even drop a link that will um uh, that will counter what this person is saying um, or or give you know a different perspective um, or I, I like to do it very often to just make fun of it of how ridiculous it is um, so I would just say like this is um, this is for you the first step is always to report it but then the second step would be to try and see if you can engage with it uh, with this person um, in a way that will uh, that will have again the positive the best positive uh, result um so yeah that would be my recommendation thank you mm -hmm. all right our last question how important is storytelling or the usage of personal narratives on social media in regards to building allyship for the jewish community but also in terms of fighting anti-semitism and anti-zionism oh my god so important such a great question i don't know who asked that but whoever asked that it's really spot on um you know, it's very hard. I mean, we all know. Uh, sorry, I'll start from the <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, Anti-Semitism a lot of times comes from um, often from people not knowing Jews or not knowing what we're about and not understanding. I mean, are you guys a religion? Are you ethnicity? You're telling us that you're a people, but then there's you know you're not really, you're not a race, but you're not like there's. Uh, it's funny, but they hate us because we're not basic uh, like they are. The anti-Semites. So uh, um, often it's uh, um, it's up to us to like really dismantle this ignorant and and um, and help them understand what being Jewish is. Um, so the importance of personal stories and your personal narrative is so like it's it's tremendous. It's uh, um, it can really change. I, I've seen. I mean, I've built a career over my personal stories, and and I think you we should all do it. We all have stories in our family um, and we all have our personal stories that are incredible that people want to hear. Um, social media is is uh, social media because it's social. It's supposed to be like, you know, people want to know who you are. And in, in an age of so much fake, you know, Kim Kardashians uh, online, uh, people are looking for authenticity. They want to see the vulnerability. They want to see you sharing your truth you know and don't be afraid of being vulnerable online yeah there might be some people that will take advantage of it and i get it a lot but just ignore them um and when you when you share your your authentic stories is it's going to create uh it's going to make such a difference for the jewish people you know in in the minute that someone 
um, reads um, something that they can connect to from this person that uh, just like me, um, I don't know, uh, um, watches the same TV shows, uh, uh, listening to the same music or likes the same music that I do, um, uh, that tells me also that he's Jewish and that this is what happened to them. It immediately breaks down a lot of the barriers that people have uh, and makes them see you in a different light and it helps them connect to you. Um, so I would say, uh, I would say like, there's nothing that you can do that is more, uh, that will be more effective than, um, uh, than actually sharing your personal story and, and storytelling and, and sharing your, your narrative. At the end of the day, um, a lot of the, as I said, like it's really coming from misconception and uh, the way to, to fight misconception is, uh, is the truth. So this is, this is where it comes and people can really engage with it. Thank you. We actually have one more question that we're gonna squeeze in and it's yeah. how did you become like a storyteller and how did you make this a career? Like where did you start and how did you end up here? Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, no, um, I started, well, I, I've seen a problem. Like I've seen that there was anti-Semitism and, and I saw it from my military service with all the international organizations and I wanted to do something to change it. Uh, and I started writing, I wrote a, I wrote a, a blog in Times of Israel, um, which everyone can do today, um, or you can even do a blog in Medium. Um, and started writing my articles. And the first articles were uh, shit. Like people <laughs> didn't enjoy them. They weren't, uh, they weren't articulated. They were, um, English is my third language. So it took me time. I asked for help from friends that were um, um, editors to edit some of my articles and they read them for me and they made it better. Um, and, um, and after writing my articles, I also started to use the social media and I used uh, all social media platforms. Um, and the more I used it, I uh, I started to realize, like, to understand how it's working. And I I think, and that's something I'm trying to do until today. I'm really trying to engage with people and not just use social media as a way to like, okay, this is my opinion, goodbye. Uh, it's like, this is my opinion, you disagree, let's have this conversation about it. And maybe I can get you closer to where I'm standing and you can, or maybe you can bring me closer to where you're standing. And also I often say, you know, when I make mistakes, I apologize. And I'm trying to like be human. And I think that's like, that probably like the, my, my best quality for this was that, um, that, I'm, that I'm not afraid of being vulnerable and I'm, uh, and I'm sharing who I am and I'm very honest with online. And I don't want to, uh, I'm bringing myself, I'm trying to bring myself online as much as possible. Um, uh, and in my writings and in my work and in my talks, um, um, you you know and and it, it was hard like i grew up not thinking that i'm not thinking highly of myself uh, i was a really heavy kid that um didn't think that he's gonna have any future outside of his small town in Petah um and i went to the army and i and things changed for me and i wanted to prove everyone wrong and i wanted to make sure that i will have um a future that i want to build for myself um and um and you know then i and then I saw that there was a way for me to have a future that also involves on doing something right and, and, and making the world a better place for my community. Um, and I can do all of this by, by being who I am. And um, all of you are, you know, everyone that are watching us um, are, uh, are beautiful in so many ways, but we're often being told by society. I mean, we spoke, I spoke about it the whole talk, how society in many ways are telling us that we're not good enough or hating us for specific um, characteristic we have or who we are um, and we can't let them win. So um, my advice to be is to be, my advice to you is to be, um, to be confident and to remember that you are all absolutely gorgeous and you all have um, qualities that the world needs to know and wants to know. People want to know you and they haven't met you yet and bring it out to the world and, um, and be proud. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing that we can do just to be proud. Wow, thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough for being here today and speaking to us. Yes. And especially, I need to thank you for all that you do for the Jewish community, for Israel, for the LGBTQ plus community. You are so inspiring and I'm so grateful that you were able to speak to us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, you can follow me online and stay in touch. And 
Yeah. Yes, everybody follow him on Instagram <laughs> at Hemmazig. I have been following him for years now and he is truly inspiring. And I look forward to his posts every day. And I know that you guys will too. So definitely follow him on social media. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone.